what I do is I come up with demonstrations. I'm a demonstration developer. I design, design and devise a demonstration that explains a scientific idea in a visual way. Sometimes I hand that over to another presenter. Sometimes I present it myself. And so what I want to do over the next hour is go through the process about how I do that. And um, because, quite frankly, it's not an easy process. And so you might think, right, well, how do you explain science to children in a four-minute slot? That is usually the maximum that I will get. So I'm going to explain all that to you, and I'm hoping that there's things that you can take away and transfer to your classroom. So the first port of call is most people think explaining science to children is easy. <laughs> they think that I don't work in adult children in, in adult science programs because I can't. I don't because I find it too easy. I like working in children's science because that is where it's difficult. And actually one of my teachers who actually taught me at high school, hello, <laughs> is here and she knows that I don't like it easy. <laughs> and so that's why I work in children's. Now these people that think explaining science to children is easy often think that when you're explaining science to children, all you need to know is the level of science that you're explaining. As you guys know, that is ridiculously far from the truth. And um, what you've got to do is you've actually got to know the whole of the subject to be able to explain a little bit of it. And that leads me back to my neuroscience roots, because you've got to do that because that's how the brain works. The brain is always striving to see a whole of a picture. It's called the Gestalt theory. You want to see everything so you can slot it into place, into the narrative of your brain. And so if you don't show people that there's a hole, it's not going to go in and it's not going to stick. Or, as a rather famous scientist once said, or reputedly said, if you can't explain it to a six-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. Or what I say to the teams that I work with in children's is, if we don't understand the whole of the story, how do we know what we can miss out? Because we've been given this amazing opportunity to get science across to 100,000 children at a time. The least we can do is make sure that we're getting the right bits of science across. So, how do I make sure I get the right bits of science across? Well, I'm a true believer in that you reap exactly what you sow. So, here are the type of things that I do. First of all, I research. And by research, I mean read. And I read a hell of a lot. Once I've been given a scientific theory that I need to know, I absorb myself in it. I've even taken university courses in things to make sure that I fully understand the subject. And the thing is, I don't only read, I talk to people. Because no person is an expert in everything. I'm an expert in coming up with demonstrations to show to children between the ages of 6 to 15. I'm not an expert in computer coding. I'm not an expert in the life and works of Caroline Herschel. I know a fair bit about her, though. But um, So what I do is I talk to people out there that are experts. I ring them up. I harass them, could be said. But I, I talk to them about what I think the theory is. I talk to them about the controversial aspects about it. I say, am I on the right lines? I use their knowledge to make sure that what I'm getting across on TV is the right stuff. So after I've researched the whole of the subject, I extract the main ideas. And this is usually about four to six sentences. And so what I've done, looked at the whole and gone, right, I think this is important, this is important. I've brought this in, I think this is important as well. And then I'm left with about six or four sentences that become my world for about a week. And what I do with those sentences is I interrogate them. I completely interrogate them. And I become a little bit of a six-year-old myself. And I ask why. I ask, why does that happen? What does that word mean? But hang on, what does that mean in real life? I, hang on, I don't understand that bit. And while I'm doing this, in a way, the phrase that I try and remember is you're only ignorant once. Because I understand science. You guys understand science. But to children coming towards it, like, some of the things just seem completely foreign. And they'd be like, but hang on, why does that happen? And it might be a subject or a principle that 
we just take as second nature, but to them, they just don't understand it. So I put myself in those shoes. I eradicate all of the scientific knowledge and try and remember what it was like to not know. And then what I end up with is I completely absorb and understand or assimilate, because it makes a nicer acronym, um, <laughs> what the theory is all about. And what that means is I end up with a one sentence learning outcome. And that one sentence learning outcome will perhaps show a certain part of the principle, but will also hint at its whole meaning. And then once I've got that learning outcome, I come up with a way to present it. Now, the way that I present it is I don't look at the principle that I started with. I look at my learning outcome and I look at the important parts of it. So presenting to me can come in two different forms. It can come in sort of a live show or a television show, but mostly they involve demonstrations. So I realise this to you, it may be, may be obvious. It may be, you might be thinking, but how does it work in practice? So let's give it a try. I'm not going to pick on people, I'm going to pick on you all. <laughs> and so what I'd like you to do is we're going to try it with a certain principle. And it's a principle that I've been asked to explain a few times. And it's this one, the Archimedes principle. Now you guys know it, it's how boats float. If you don't know it, let me just phrase it for you. An object wholly or partially immersed in a fluid at rest is buoyed up by a force the magnitude of which is equal to the weight of the fluid displaced by the body. Simple. <laughs> so what we've got to do is think about the important parts and come up with what is that one important part of it. And then what we do is come up with a demo for it or a way to visually show it. And when I'm coming up with my demos, there's a few things that I think about. So I want you guys to be thinking about the demo that you would come up to explain this principle. And your demo should be, you've got to make it entertaining. Now, entertaining does not mean wearing a brightly coloured lab coat and a wig that makes you look like a mad scientist. You don't need to do that. Entertaining can be a little more sophisticated than that. It's, it's about using the tools of engagement. It's about using humour or surprise or suspense. It's about using intriguing narrative so people want to go through that story. As humans, we love stories. So make it into a story. Use the tools of engagement. Don't just go, Woo, this is fun. Because if you've got to say it's fun, it's not. So make it entertaining. And the reason I want to make it entertaining, especially for TV, is because if people aren't watching, they're just not going to learn. I've got to get their attention before then learning can occur. Without attention, no learning. They're just going to turn over. So for me, make it entertaining is important. For you, perhaps less so, especially if you lock the doors. But... <laughs> It's up to you in terms of the type of pupils that you have. The second thing you've got to do, or that I do, is I build on familiarity. And there's a, there's a few reasons that I do this. The first reason is comfort zones. Because science makes a lot of people feel a bit like this. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's an intimidating subject. And it's intimidating because... It's about the unknown. It's about finding out. It's about questioning. And sometimes the unknown can be a scary place to be if you're not comfortable with that. And so if I'm explaining a principle that is completely foreign to children, the least I can do is link it to something that they do understand, that they are familiar with. So they're happy with that. They understand the thing that they're familiar with. And then to adding new knowledge in, they, they would accept it. They'll be more ready to accept. So that's the first reason. The second reason I build on familiarity is because it's how the brain works. Basically, the way you form memories is you form memories through association. So if you can link a memory to a thing in your past or to an object that you already know, then this new knowledge will just hook onto it. And so it will stick and it will stay and you will remember that every time you go back to that familiar situation. So building on familiarity, comfort zones, but also because we're wired to be able to learn from familiarity. The second thing, or the third thing, if I could count, is um, don't use jargon unless you explain it. Now, a lot of people think that jargon comes hand in hand with science, and it's just synonymous with it. 
And if you don't use jargonistic terms, then no learning is occurring. I'm not of that camp, because I think that jargon is just shorthand. So there are always other words you can use to explain the jargon. You don't have to use it. Sometimes it's nice to use it, because it's nice to introduce it, because they'll need it later on. But always explain it. Always either start with the explanation and then introduce the jargon, or start with the jargon and then explain it. You can explain it either verbally or visually, but don't just dump it on people, because again, that takes them out their comfort zone. So, those three pointers for the demonstration, and you might have in your head now a demonstration that you think could show the Archimedes principle. And this is where you are like, please don't pick on me. <laughs> now, I'm not going to, because it's just a thought process. I want to take you through the thought process, but what I want to do is show you some that I've done. But I also want to show you some of the ones that I've done that I'm not that happy with. And so we can all learn from my mistakes, let's say. So I'm going to show you a video of when I was asked to explain the Archimedes Principle, and it was for the for first series of Richard Hammond's Blast Lab. Now, if you're not familiar with um, children's TV and don't watch it as much as me, that's fair enough, um, Richard Hammond's Blast Lab was transmitted in about 2009 onwards, and it was a scientific game show um, presented by Richard Hammond, obviously. And there were two groups of children that would come in and they'd have to take part in in-studio games, but also there would be VTs, so videotapes, shown into the studio of larger demonstrations where they had to check and guess whether the demonstration would work or it wouldn't. And in this particular one that I'm going to show you, we attempted to build a boat out of cardboard. And so the teams had to guess whether the cardboard boat would float or sink. Now, in order to be able to do that, they need to know how ordinary things float. So this is the explanatory graphic I produced. The reason boats float can be explained by the Archimedes principle. For our boat to float, it needs to displace, which means push aside, a volume of water that's the same or more as the weight of the boat. However, this usually relies on the boat being made of a waterproof material like metal, plastic or painted wood, not cardboard. So, was that any good? In my opinion, no. And um, excuses are no good, but here's my excuse for that. This was the first time I'd been given the tool of using animation. And I got a little bit overexcited by it. I, I was like, wow, you can do, with you know, with animations, you can do things that you can't do in reality. I could have water pouring in and then a boat going onto scales. That's brilliant. That'll allow the children to be able to understand what it's about. And visually, I'm quite happy with that. But with the words, I was just lazy. I didn't even change the words at all. Basically, I just regurgitated Archimedes' principle and put it to an animatory graphic, right? That's not good enough. So what I could do is I learned from that and I learned to not get excited about a new medium and just still concentrate on the words. Yes, use all the mediums that are available to you, but don't forget that the words are important as well. So I learned from that and I took it on board. And um, I got another opportunity. This is what happens in TV. It goes in cycles. I got another opportunity to explain the Archimedes principle, and this time concentrate a little bit more on density and the different density of things, because that's quite a hard concept, especially because the viewership of CBC is sort of from five and six onwards. So it's quite a hard concept to get. And um, again, this was Richard Hammond's Blast Lab. We'd moved on to the fourth series. And in this, um, it was a bit of a convoluted backstory, to be honest with you. There was a guy who had a disease that was called Stuckongwingiitis. And the only way to cure Stuckongwingiitis was to get in a paddling pool full of salt. But it had to be the right concentration of salt. So to make sure it was the right concentration of salt, he had to use his trusty sidekick, which was inevitably a large rubber duck and called McQuack. And this rubber duck, I'd filled it with just enough sand so it sunk. And then we'd add salt to the paddling pool of water to hopefully make it float again. And then we'd know the concentration of salt was right to cure stuck on with the itis, obviously. Um, so I'm going to show you that clip. 
and let's see what we think of that. To aid Ferdinand in his quest to find a cure, he's turned to his trusty sidekick, McQuack. McQuack has been filled with just enough sand to make him sink in fresh water. But if we add enough salt, the duck will float once more. Hang on a second, that doesn't sound right. I think we need an animation here. For an object to float on a liquid, the liquid must be more dense than the whole of the object and the air contained within it. In normal water, its particles are spread out, so it's not that dense. At first, the water is less dense than McQuack, which is why he sinks. But if we add salt, the water increases in density, eventually becoming more dense than McQuack, so he can now rise to the surface. So that was McQuack, and um, he did cure him of Stockholm mediatus, just so you know. And um, so was I happy with that? No. Um, I was slightly happy. You could probably see what I did there in terms of with the density. And um, I didn't explain it verbally, but I explained it visually with the oversized particles. And it took, took me quite a while to figure out how to explain density with, because I literally, I think that's 30 seconds long. And so it was trying to condense that science into a 30 second clip that would make sense, meaningful sense. And, um, and so no, I wasn't completely happy with that, mostly because density is said far too much. And the word dense, it starts with the word dense, which is a very strange word for children to be introduced to because they usually associate it with something completely different. Um, so this I wasn't happy with either. And to be honest, if we look back at my tips for making a good demo, I didn't even stick to them. Yeah, it was made entertaining because there was the whole convoluted backstory of the stuck on wingiitis, which trust me was funny. Um, but the build on familiarity, whenever do you put a giant rubber duck in a paddling pool? I just didn't do it. And the jargon, there was so much dense and density thrown in there, it was just dense with it. Um, so I didn't even follow my own rules. And that's because these rules didn't exist back then. And this is one of the the worst and best things about working in TV. Your work is there for eternity. Which, as horrible as it is to watch yourself and your work back again and again and watch your mistakes back, it's an amazing opportunity. It's an amazing opportunity to learn from it and to go, hang on, that didn't quite work. What if I do this? What if I do that? And I do that. I'm a scientist. I study my work and I actually view it scientifically. So I look at the viewing figures. I look at, to me, what worked and what didn't. And that's allowed me, over these 10 years, to come up with these rules. Which is actually why I'm really excited to be here doing this talk. Because I can imagine that not every lesson that you do is recorded. And you get to watch it back. And you have to sit in front of it and watch it back and learn from it. I do. So in a way, I've got this... I've got this opportunity to learn from my mistakes and pass on my learning, which is what this, this event is about. So, um, I, yes, looking at your mistakes is horrible. And no one wants to do that. But no one wants to be ignorant to their mistakes either. So, in a way, I view it as an opportunity to get better and to get things right. So, how do I get... Archimedes principle, right. Well, I actually got a, ch a chance in 2012, when this program came along. Absolute genius with Dick and Dom. Because um, after Blast Lab, there wasn't children's science programs on the CBBC for about three years. So that allowed me to study all of my programs of the past and come up with these rules. And in those three years, what I did is I transferred what I'd learned onto the stage. And so I wrote a few stage shows for BBC Learning, took them out on the road, and in a way, that was good as well because you got that immediate reaction from the crowd. And because I was behind the stage at that time, I could actually mingle with the crowd and not spy, that's a strong word, but listen to what they were saying about the show, listen to the parts that worked and didn't, and we recorded the show. So in a way, I got to hone those rules so I could get it right for absolute genius. And because um, what had been happening with those shows as well is I'd mostly been concentrating on scientists of the past. And I'd got a little bit obsessed with the history of science, especially through the people that I knew, still knew from the Science Museum. And what I loved about the history of science 
was the demonstrations that these scientists were doing from the past and how we could learn from their demonstrations scientific principles. And so in 2012, this program came along and <laughs> turns out this program was about looking at scientists from the past and looking at their demonstrations and what we could learn from their demonstrations in terms of scientific principles. Um, and it just so happens they were looking for someone to design their demonstrations. So I came on as the science consultant, um, and basically <laughs> from there um, wrote a lot of the shows. They realised that I wasn't just a presenter, that I was obsessed with explaining science to children. And when I turned up on my first day with a big suitcase full of all my books and two scripts of the programme written, they were like, ah, oh, this is going to be good. Um, and so I was given a lot of freedom. And now... When I did sit down on my first day, um, we went through all of the geniuses that we would cover, um, and one of them, you probably guessed it, Archimedes. So I had these rules now, and I was like, this is my opportunity to get it right. So I had my rules, sat down, and I did it. So I went back to the Archimedes principle, and I thought, what are the four things I want to take away from this? And I actually, you know, yes, I, what I did is I not only studied the Archimedes principle, but also the background story to Archimedes. And if you know it about the crown and weighing the crown and making sure that he wasn't being duped by this crown maker, um, and thought about what was the important part of that story. And um, I got very obsessed with chocolate and nuts in chocolate and trying to translate it to that, but that's another story. And um, so from that, I got my four principles that I dragged out of the Archimedes principle. And I'll read them quite quickly to you. So um, the first one was, an object floats if the weight of the water it displaces is equal to or greater than its weight. The number two was, an object will float if it is less dense than the fluid it is trying to float on. The volume of water displaced is equal to the volume of the object. And that was key in the Archimedes story. Um, and an object will float if the buoyant force is equal to or greater than the weight of the object. Now, if you read those, you might be like, hang on, they're all saying the same things, apart from maybe number three. But they're not. They're saying them in different ways, and they're different concepts to get across. One of them is opposing forces. One of them is in terms of the water being displaced and it rising. The other one is about in terms of density. And so they're all different ideas, and that's why I wanted to separate them. And then... I harassed these. I harassed them and I interrogated them. And I came up with my one sentence learning outcome. And my one sentence learning outcome was this. For a certain weight, the bigger the object is, the more likely it is to float. Which <laughs> sounds really simple. And, um, but to get that from the Archimedes principle actually took a lot of honing it down. And if you were to say that to a kid, they'd be like, yeah, I get it. If I just gave them the Archimedes principle to begin with, they'd be like, seriously? And um, so I had this one sentence learning outcome. And it was this one sentence learning outcome that I concentrated on for the demo. And what I did with the demo is I tried to make it entertaining. And I built on familiarity. So think about the things that where, for a certain weight, you get bigger objects and things that kids are used to and maybe tie it into floating. And number three, not using jargon, this was quite interesting because um, the SP, on, so the series producer on Absolute Genius, was adamant that I wasn't allowed to use the word density, which was quite difficult. So, but we wanted to explain density. So I had to explain density without using the word density, and there were no animations in this. So I was trying to think about how to get around this. But also, the executive producer really wanted me to use the word buoyancy, um, just because she was of the camp that if science, if a jargon isn't used, then science isn't being done. And I was like, ah, oh. so I, I didn't want to use buoyancy without explaining it, but I'm not the boss. So I came up with this sequence. And it's a sequence that was familiar, hopefully it's entertaining, and it actually fitted into two parts. And so for this bit that you are about to see, I actually wrote the entire part of it. Um, so I'll show it you. 
So boys, choose anything you want. We can have any bag of sweets we want, so long as it weighs exactly 100 grams. 100 grams of tea, please. Come in, come in. Group, group, please. Oh, right, Liz. Which one? Come on, Down the friend. M. Down the M. Run out of 100 grams of anarchy ball, please. Anarchy ball, anarchy ball. No, okay. sports mix. Oh. No, there's a sense of music, Jack. I want some mini marshmallows. Mm. Lots of them. Can I try a rainbow pencil, please? Wait. Down the bottom, right Fran. OK, OK, I want it. Mm, that's good. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't like them. No. Wait, stop stuffing your faces. Right, I mean, we're not complaining or anything. All right, Fran, but what's all this got to do with our comedies? Well, our comedians, he didn't spend his time in sweet shops, but he spent his time studying materials. And he knew that different materials could weigh the same, but you get different amounts of material for that same weight. So what you're saying is, basically, you get some light and fluffy marshmallows, you get loads of them for 100 grams. Yeah. Ah, but only a few and a sea balls. Exactly. And our comedians figured out that the more of a material you get for that certain weight, the more likely it is to float. Mmm. So these... With more of them, are more likely to float than these few anarchy balls. Yeah, exactly. Ah. If you right. don't believe me, let's try it. All right, experiment time. Go then. Mm. Ah, sinkage. Sinkage, yes. Sinkage, see that? Mm. Mm. So, get them in. There you are. There you're floating. Ah, uh, Eureka. Eureka. There you are. But hang on a minute. Metal sinks just like the anarchy balls, doesn't it? You don't get much for its weight. But how come, like, a metal boat float? There's loads of metal. It's a good question, that. But to explain it, we're going to need loads more water than this. Oh. I think this should just about do it. Yeah, well, it's a very nice pull, Fran, but you were supposed to be showing us how metal boats float. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. Well, the thing is, we know that if you've got two objects of the same weight, then the bigger one is more likely to float. So, like, with the anise balls and the marshmallows. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's the reason why metal boats float. If you had just a lump of metal, like iron, all crushed together, then it wouldn't float. But if you make that metal bigger by making it into boat shape, you've got the same weight but a bigger object. And then it's going to float. Exactly. And it's the same with people, too. You two, get your trunks on. <coughs> And yeah. jump in. Boy! Oh, yeah. Oh, see what you mean. Just like the aniseed balls, we don't float in water. But you can make a person more likely to float, more buoyant, by adding armbands and rubber rings to them. Because right. that makes them bigger without changing their weight much. Oh, oh like, like this! this. Yeah, so basically what Archimedes is saying is that uh, now we're, in essence, bigger, we're more likely to float. Exactly what I'm saying. Oh, that's very clever. No, come on! Yeah. <laughs> it's horrible watching yourself back on screen. It doesn't get any easier, just so you know. Um, so, did I get that right? Well, here we go. The head of CBBC liked it so much that he put it forward for nominations for the children's BAFTAs. The people at BAFTA liked it so much that it ended up in the final four for the nominations for the children's BAFTAs of the best um, factual children's. And we were there on the night and we didn't win. <laughs> so did I get it right? Very nearly almost. <laughs> um, but that, like I said, it's, it's this strange thing and this working in this world of being able to just learn from your mistakes but learn from your mistakes in a very harsh way because everybody is watching your work so everyone will have opinions on it and so if you don't have those opinions and watch yourself back then in fact you're going to get worse at your job and other people are going to get better at your job because they're learning from your mistakes if that makes sense now I'm very much aware that you guys don't do this stuff on TV which um, it is a lot of fun, but it's a lot of hard work, trust me. And um, so you might be thinking, well, that's all well and good, but how does it relate to us? How does it relate to live performances, let them be? So um, what I want to do is actually go into the other side of my work, which is taking demos and doing them with a live audience in a theatre or at a festival, which in a way, maybe that's some things that you can then extrapolate to the classroom, because in a way you are, you are performing. You're in front of a crowd of 30, and you are teaching them, you are engaging them. And so I do that, but to crowds of about 1,500, which can be quite intimidating. So, 
how do I go about doing that? It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same principle. Um, the only thing that differs is basically when I'm coming up with my simulation, when I'm learning the entire thing and my learning outcomes, yes, I come up with one sentence learning outcome, but that one sentence learning outcome is for that particular demo, not for the entire show. And so what I do is I do a little um, learning outcome for each demo, and in a way for a whole show, I end up having three learning outcomes in which these smaller learning outcomes feed into. So, and my demos, exactly the same. I make it entertaining, build on familiarity, and don't use jargon unless I explain it. Did you notice that I had to get in that buoyant into that clip? But we got it there. And um, so what I want to do for the remaining time is actually show you a show that I've been working on recently. When I say recently, for about the past year. And it's a show that when I, I muted the idea about people, and I'd written a lot of shows in the past, and I really wanted a difficult show to write. And when I put feelers out about this show, everyone would told me it was impossible. So I tried to do it. Um, and what the show's about is it's about computer coding. And so I wanted to look at how to translate computer coding into a visual way and an entertaining way. Um, so, this was the one that I actually took to university course for, and I took, so iTunes U, I'm so glad it exists. So I took a course in Python, I learned how to code, I'd coded when I was eight on my spectrum, I hadn't coded since. I'm not an expert in coding, I'm an expert in demos. And I met with a lot of people, a lot of with people from Raspberry Pi, I met with digital artists, I met with people who had been coding since they were very, very small and were, were the leading experts. And I took time and I learned, and I learned about the subject. And then I came up with my learning outcomes, and my learning outcomes for the show were this. I wanted to look at the components of a computer system. So what exactly do we mean by a computer? I wanted to show that any input can lead to any output. And then I also thought, and this <laughs> ended up being um, this came from a very heated discussion at Vauxhall Station with a computer coder who explicitly told me there is no way I can have a stage show on computer coding without doing coding in it. This terrified me. I'd only been coding four months. So the fact that I would have to live code on stage, I was like, seriously? And they were like, yes. She was like, how can you show people computer coding without showing them computer coding? And I was like, you're right. And so that was why it was really important for me to talk to these experts. So my third learning outcome was to expose the audience to computer programming and what it actually looks like. So I came up with my show, which is called Error 404. <laughs> and, um, and for the next, for the remaining time, I want to show you a few extracts from that. I'm not going to perform it as I usually perform it, because you're not children and we'd all want to gouge our eyeballs out if I treated you like children. So what I'm going to do is explain my thinking behind the demos, but also show you the demos as well. So I think I should get started, right? So now with Error 404, what I decided to do was <laughs> involve... So I'm a trained pyrotechnician. So I wanted to combine that with computer coding. And so Error 404 is a mix between computers coding and explosions. And so to me, that, that really made it entertaining and intriguing. It was using that tool of engagement immediately. That's my starting sentence when I go to a school and do this show. And everyone in their head is like, how on earth can you link computers and exploding? And there you've got your brain. Your brain's going, hang on, I want to link those two together because she's told me she's going to link them together. So how can we? And so you're immediately engaged in that. And so what I do is I start with the familiar. So over here, we've got a balloon, and that balloon's filled with hydrogen. And this is a demonstration that you probably have performed in your class. So the so balloon full of hydrogen and candle on a stick. So we're starting with that familiarity. This is something that you're familiar with and that the children in your pupils will probably have seen. And what we're going to do is I'm going to light that hydrogen balloon. And what will happen is because hydrogen is flammable, it will burn really quickly. When things burn really quickly, they produce a powerful sound wave. That sound wave we will hear as a loud bang. So I'm going to put my ear defenders on. 
And you guys may want to pop your hands over your ears. But before you do that, what we're going to do is we're going to have to do a countdown, obviously. And I know you're not going to be as loud as my normal audience with this. Um, but when I say we're going to do a countdown from three, so we're going to go three, two, one, I'll light the balloon, bang, ooh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> and the only person I think that has to flame proof their scarves. So let's go for a countdown from three, three two, two, one. There we go. Someone ooed. Nice work. <laughs> but to be honest with you, that's the familiar. You were expecting that. Who, who's seen one of those before? Exactly. You all knew that was going to happen. That's how you light it, I presume, with a candle on a stick. That's how everyone lights it. But why don't we expand on the familiar? Because over here, I've got another balloon. Now, this balloon... Stay where you are, candle. Now, this balloon is a different colour, and because for good practice, I put different gases in different coloured balloons, and this one has got um, a little bit of oxygen in it as well. And, um, and so this is a sort of a, a trick with presenting and stuff. If I just had that full of hydrogen, then you know what's coming. What you've got to do is also always... You, your last bang has always got to be your biggest. And so I couldn't do the same bang that you've just seen, because then you'd be under-impressed, because you knew what you were expecting. And so you've got to add oxygen in the next one so it gives a louder bang because it burns a little bit faster, faster, more powerful sound wave, louder bang reaching your ears. But that's not all. What I've done with this balloon is we're going to actually fire it with a computer. And to fire things with a computer, you need an input. So I've got this little red button here. Usually you have a big red button, not here. We've got our little red button. So I'm going to push that little red button, and it's going to fire our balloon. I don't know why I'm taking those off, because I'm going to need them. And, um, but because the button's connected to a computer, I've been able to change the process a little bit. So what I've done is I've programmed my computer so it leaves a space. And it leaves a space for our countdown. So originally, you guys went three, two, one. We lit the balloon, it went bang. Here. I'm going to do the input, so I'm going to touch the button. Then we do the countdown. Three, two, one. Then the balloon goes back. OK? So, as I said, this one's going to be louder. So, hands on ears. And just making everything live. And I'm going to push the button, and I'll lead the countdown with you. So I'm pushing the button. Now. Three, two, one. There we go. So you hopefully felt that in your belly a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it goes to show that we can set things off with computers. But to be honest with you, like this is what I was saying about each of the learning outcomes feeding into a big one. Each of these have just been feeding into my first learning outcome. So looking at the components that computers are made of. And you might be thinking, hang on, we haven't even looked at computers. But what I do is I then pull the audience into the computer that I use to set that off. Because it fits in this little box here. And that's the computer. Now you probably can't see it, but it's a Raspberry Pi. And you guys will have heard, you're nodding, you're like, yeah, we've heard of Raspberry Pis and we don't know how to use them either. And, um, and so if you can't quite see it there, I've got one here. And so I set that off with a Raspberry Pi. Now, the story of me actually getting my Raspberry Pi was um, I, I was really obsessed with them, but I was a little bit nervous and I didn't know where to buy it. And I didn't, there was like these Model A's, these Model B's, do they do different things? I don't know, no one really explains it in words that I can understand. So what I did is I asked for one for Christmas. And, um, and I got one for Christmas. And during the show, I go into the story of how I was ridiculously excited. I'm a little bit childish, unless you can't tell. And I opened it up, and I was really excited to get my Raspberry Pi. And then I had no idea what to do with it. Absolutely none. Because to me, this just was a circuit board. And, 
And it's what a lot of children think as well. When they get it, they're like, yeah, I want a Raspberry Pi, but I don't really know what to do with it. And, um, and so this was the bit that I decided where I could link in to the familiar. Because to me, this doesn't look like a computer. A computer to me looks like this. And this is probably the, the computer that you're familiar with as well. And so what I do is I go into the different parts of a computer. So I will run this like I run it in a show. Because what we do is we look at the important parts of a computer. So we have, well, we have a mouse, don't we? And you move your mouse around, and that moves the cursor around on the screen. Um, so who thinks the mouse is an integral part of a computer? Who thinks it's the most important part? Nah. Nah, it's not, is it? Right. So it's not important, and quite a good job that it's not. So we've got the keyboard. And what the keyboard allows you to do is to put numbers and letters in to the computer so you can tell it what to do. Uh, who thinks the keyboard is the most important part of a computer? No. <laughs> no. It's not. <laughs> Keyboard's not really that important. Then, we have the monitor. Now, what the monitor allows you to do is see the output from the computer. So that could be a video, it could be an essay that you're writing, it could be an email, um, and it allows us to see the output. <laughs> so who thinks the monitor is the most important part of a computer? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, I'm just going to put this down here. <laughs> Because, to be honest with you, those things are important, but to me, they're not the most important. What the keyboard and the mouse do is there are inputs. They allow you to talk to the computer, as it will. They allow you to type certain things in, and the mouse allows you to navigate. So together, <coughs> they're called inputs. The screen is... I've <laughs> I thought I'd thread it. I was like, where is it? Um, the screen is our output, so it allows you to see what comes out. But between the inputs and the outputs, there's really important parts of a computer. And they live in here. The only problem is you can't see them at the moment. So what I need to do is in my training, while I went to this university course and everything, they taught me how to get inside of here. And what you need is you actually need a special tool, a really precise tool. And it's um, here. Now we're inside the computer, we can investigate the important parts. Um, so underneath here, let's get rid of this blue bit, and then here, just like that. Here, this little triangle-shaped, triangle-shaped, diamond-shaped silver part, that's the CPU of the computer, the central processing unit. And it's like the brains of a computer. When you ask a computer to do a certain task, it's the CPU that makes sure that that task gets done and completes it. And, um, and what the CPU does is it actually draws on instructions that it's got in its memory. And it's got two different kinds of memory. It's got one that lives just in here, this. Now this is called your random access memory, or your RAM. And what it is, it's like your short-term memory of your brain. So it can, remember, it can remember instructions, but it can't remember them for very long. And it can't remember very many. It's sort of like the post-it note of the computer. So when it's trying to work things out, it uses it as its notebook to make sure that it's got enough capacity to be able to do it. Most of the instructions for a computer actually come from a place down here, which is this thing here. And that is the permanent storage of the computer, which is called a hard drive. And it's called a hard drive just because it's... Um, Hard? That is literally the only way. And so what's stored in there is all of the instructions that you give to a computer for it to be able to complete the tasks it does. So during that sequence then, what I've done is I've gone through the components of a computer, but you actually you want to know about them. You want to know about them because I saw all of your faces and you were intrigued by that performance then. Because of the explosions that came before, you were actually like, yes. And there were tools of engagement there in terms of that didn't need to be done. I don't need to use a hammer to smash this open. And, um, but in a way, it just adds a little bit of humour. And if you add humour, if you add intrigue, if you add surprise, if you add intriguing narrative, 
then you can capture the audience and get them on that journey with you. So what I, what I do after that is we actually go into computer programs as algorithms and we look at them, basically algorithms are just a recipe, just a series of instructions that get things done in a certain way. Uh, then we go into different outputs and inputs um, because, and it all hones down to this final explosion, which I do, and which we're going to try now. Um, there's a lot for me to think about during this, but it's a lot of fun. Now, you were probably quite intrigued by these balloony things as you were coming in, and that's because what we're going to do is we're going to program an explosion together. Um, and the way we're going to do this is the way that a computer works. So you start with your input. Now, an input, yes, it can be a red button. Yes, it can be a mouse. It can be a keyboard. But to be honest with you, an input can be absolutely anything. And what I've done is over here, I've got another Raspberry Pi. And I've adapted this Raspberry Pi so its inputs can be either a banana or a juicy pear. <laughs> and so what you guys do is you get to choose which one's going to be our input for the explosion. So hands up for banana. Hands up for juicy pear. OK, here's juicy pear. Now what I'm going to do is I just need to wire both of those in to my Raspberry Pi. So I just put that one there and that one there like so. And what I'm going to do is just get up the code that I've written on the Raspberry Pi. So we're actually going to be seeing the output from my Raspberry Pi on screen. There we go. And that thing on the left will disappear in a little while. And when I, I just need to find my cursor. There we go. Hello, where are you? There we go. So. What we need to do is you might be intrigued that I actually wired in both of my inputs, even though you only chose the juicy pair. And that's because wiring things in, that's not the important part. Here we're concentrating on the programming. So we're going to program our Raspberry Pi to listen to not banana, but juicy pear. And the way that we do that is Raspberry Pis, you see these little sticky algae bits here. They're called general purpose input output pins. Or they're just simply digital switches. And you can switch them on and off. And they have different numbers. Different numbers refer to different pins, which refer to different switches. So it can make other things do different things. So I've actually got control of my Raspberry Pi now with this keyboard and mouse. I'm controlling my Pi, which is here, which is shown on the output there. Not at all confusing. So if I scroll down. What I've done is I've allocated certain numbers to certain inputs. So the number 7 is banana, but the number 22 is juicy pear. Now if we scroll down a bit more to the code that I've written, here it says chosen input. So all I need to do is delete, well it says chosen button, so I delete that bit that says chosen button and put in the chosen button, 22. That's all I've done. So now my computer is listening to Juicy Pear. So that is our input. We now need to go on to our output. Now, yes, outputs can be screens. But the thing that really excites me about computer coding is that outputs can be absolutely anything. And I mean anything. So in this instance, they're going to be explosions, obviously. And what I've got is we've got our countdown. So yes, at the start, we did a verbal countdown. But this is going to be a fire countdown. So we've got three balloons there. And these balloons are full of butane gas. So they're not going to be as loud as the hydrogen. They're going to be more of a whoosh and a fireball. Um, but they're programmed to go off one second after each other. But the thing is that we haven't programmed is the order that they go off in. And so you guys get to choose the order. Um, so we've got the yellow, the blue, and the green. So think about which one you want to go off first. We'll start with that. It's always good to start at the beginning. Um, so one to go off first. Hands up for yellow first. Oh, you're not that popular, yellow. Blue? Green? 
Okay, it's just green there. I know which one you're going to choose now. <laughs> so green is first. So the one to go off second is either yellow. Oh, you're being kind to me. Or blue. Did you say no? You did, didn't you? You don't want blue. Do you want yellow? Yeah, yeah, yeah let's do yellow. I don't, no, I don't, I don't want to fix it because then you think it's fixed. Let's try it again. So who wants yellow? Right, blue. Blue actually wins there. So we're going to do green, blue, yellow. Green, blue, yellow. Green, blue, yellow. Green, blue, yellow. Green, blue. I'm sort of using my post-it note of my brain. Green, blue, yellow. And then what I need to do is program that. So up here, we've got the balloons and they're allocated to their numbers. So we've got green, blue, yellow. Oh, that's quite nice. So that's 13, 12, 11. 13, 12, 11. 13, 12, 11. 13, 12, 11. But it's not fixed. You guys chose it. So 13, 12, 11. So what I need to do is I go down here to this part, because this part here that I'm on now, where it says GPO at input 22, that is basically saying when that switch is touched, do the next bit. And the next bit here is output to a certain pin. And that pin is number 13, because that's what we chose. And what that does is that turns on pin number 13. Now what we need to do, just as with any switch, we need to switch it off. So I just put 13 here as well. So that means put switch on, 13, switch off, 13. And so here we do the same for balloon 2, so we've got 12, and then switch off 12, like that. And then down here, we just do 11, and then here we do 11. Now, this part in terms of, so this is us live coding. And just as an aside, I, um, considering I've been coding for a year on and off, I had to do this live coding. Um, I did a science show at the Apollo just before Christmas, which is a seater of about 4,500. And, um, and I actually bought a new mouse and keyboard because I knew that my hands would be shaking so much that I needed a mouse that would be able to negotiate that shake. Because for me to live code in front of that many people absolutely terrified me. Because if any of you have coded before, you will know that you cannot make any slight mistake <coughs> at all. And, um, but it did go fine. But let's see if it goes fine today. So we've got the um, 13, 12, 11, all gone. And what I do is I just save the program. But what you'll see there, you observant science teachers, will be another output. And that output is number 16. And it prints boom. And it prints boom <coughs> because it's another explosion. Because obviously those are the countdown. A countdown goes towards a bigger explosion. That's how countdowns work. So inside this oil drum here, which I'm going to place here, and turn the seam so it's not in your face. There we go. Inside here, I've got another balloon. Now, this balloon is the same as the second one that we set off, so it's got hydrogen and oxygen in it, which means it's going to be pretty loud. But what I've done <coughs> is I've put in an oil drum. And what an oil drum does is amplify that sound a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> now, the bad thing about putting it in an oil drum means um, you can't see when it goes off. So to put things on top so you can see demos have to be visual, what I've done is I've got of these. Nice. All right. So we should, <laughs> should be set to go. Now, here is what should happen. When I touch my juicy pair, the green balloon should go off then the blue, then the yellow, then this final explosion. And that's the explosion that you guys have chosen. I'm going to get my ear defenders on and do my final safety checks. And I advise that you guys put your hands over your ears. And plus, if anything, i.e. a bit of balloon or a ball comes towards your face, just slightly move your face out the way. So, 
I just need to save it again because I'm super paranoid. And I'm going to do what's called run my program. And that'll come up with when it's ready. It's ready. I need to connect my battery. Right. I'm going to arm the system, so hands on ears. And I'm going to touch the juicy pear. As you can see, most of my demos do lead to a little bit of a mess. But basically, that all of that is to show that different outputs and different inputs are possible. And because um, you might think, well, that's just a way to set things on fire. Naughty balloon. Was that the green balloon? No, no good, because the green balloon is my nemesis at the moment. So at least it wasn't the green balloon. But it just goes to show that you can, using visual ways, you can actually show quite complex things, just if you think outside the box a little bit and try things that are a little bit scary. And in terms of me trying that show on computer coding, for people to go, it's impossible to make computer coding visual. Well, that's visual. And, um, and I, I hope you, you agree that that was visual. So this does bring us on to, do you know what? I always lose my bits because I've got so many little bits. That does bring us to the end of this. But I hope that there's been things that you can take away from this that then you can transfer to your classroom to ignite the imagination of your pupils and get them thinking because when I come and do shows or when I'm on the stage or on TV I'm very much aware that I've only got four minutes I'm not a teacher I can't teach an entire curriculum in an hour-long show or a four-minute piece but what I do is I ignite their imagination and their enthusiasm so one they're more ready to listen when they come back to class but two they want to learn and they want to find out so I hope this has inspired you to find out about demos a little bit more. Thank you very much for listening. I'm John Scott.